everyone, welcome to Inside the Americas. Coming up, FDR, LBJ, and JRB. Joe Biden hoping to add his initials to the line of U.S. presidents who've shifted the state of the U.S. thanks to massive public spending in infrastructure. Then, COVID deaths in Brazil hit a record 4,000 a day. Emergency rooms are cracking under the pressure as President Jair Bolsonaro continues to oppose a nationwide lockdown. And we'll take you to Mexico, where millions of monarch butterflies have found sanctuary from possible extinction. I'm Jeannie Godula. Joe Biden's new infrastructure plan has been described as the biggest overhaul in the U.S. since the 1930s New Deal. That $2.3 trillion package would not just improve the country's transportation, communications, water, and electrical networks. It also hopes to shift the U.S. toward greener energy and outcompete China. But the massive package is certain to meet opposition in Congress with Republicans already criticizing its scale. Well, to talk more about this with me now, I'm joined on the set by France 24's Yuka Roye. Yuka, first of all, tell us a bit more about what's in the project. It's not just about roads and bridges. Well, Jeannie, it's actually called the American Jobs Plan. President Biden says that if passed, this bill uh, will create millions more jobs. Now, the aim here is really to reshape the American economy. And for that, it goes way beyond traditional infrastructure spending. Uh, now, a big chunk of the $2 trillion package would still uh, go into rebuilding, repairing roads and bridges or improving uh, the quality of water supplies. Uh, but all that really is badly needed. Uh, but this bill also calls for uh, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to be invested into technology uh, to fight climate change, for instance, or to make the internet faster. Uh, money would also be spent on uh, providing affordable housing and care for the most vulnerable. So in effect, uh, President Biden wants to address inequality with this bill. It builds a fair economy that gives everybody a chance to succeed and is going to create the strongest, most resilient, innovative economy in the world. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It's a once-in-a-generation investment in America, unlike anything we've seen or done since we built the interstate highway system and the space race decades ago. Yuka, we're still talking about $2.3 trillion. It's so much money. How is the Biden administration planning on paying for it all? Well, simply put, by raising taxes on big companies over 15 years. President Biden wants to raise the corporate uh, tax rate from the current 21% to 28%, though that would still be way below the 35% that was in place uh, before Donald Trump's tax reform back in 2017. Uh, another key idea is a global minimum tax at 21%. Uh, that's basically to prevent uh, big international companies from shielding their profits away in uh, overseas tax havens. Republicans are still up in arms. They say this plan is just too expensive. They say it has very little to do with infrastructure. How difficult do you think it's going to be for this bill to actually pass in Congress? Well, the fight really boils down to the very definition of infrastructure. For those opposing the bill, things like housing and uh, caregiving uh, are social issues and should not be included in the bill. Uh, so the Republican Senate majority minority leader, Mitch McConnell, has vowed to fight the plan every step of the way. And that will make it very difficult uh, for the bill to be adopted uh, by the Senate, uh, which, as you know, is equally evenly split along party lines today. Uh, but this week, Democrats got a big boost from the, the Senate parliamentarian. It's an official uh, who really has the last word on what should or should not be allowed under the chamber's rules. Now, she said that it's OK for Democrats to continue uh, using what's called a budget reconciliation that would allow them to pass a bill uh, with a simple majority rather than a three-fifth majority that's generally required. In other words, without Republican support. But we still expect to see, though, weeks and weeks of debate, negotiations and political wrangling. Yuka, thank you for breaking it down for us. France 24's Yuka Royer. Well, Joe Biden's not only hoping to push through that massive infrastructure package, he's also speeding up America's already impressive vaccine schedule. Over 40% of Americans have received at least one shot, with more than half of those over 65 already fully vaccinated. Biden now says all adults will be eligible to get the vaccine there as of April 19th, two weeks ahead of the original deadline. 
But the president did issue a word of caution, saying Americans need to remain on a, quote, war footing if they want to beat the pandemic. The situation is not so bright in Brazil, however. It's fast on its way to surpassing the U.S. as the country with the highest death toll from COVID-19. This week saw a record 4,000 people die in Brazil in just one day. And as more and more contagious variants continue to circulate, hospitals are being overwhelmed. But any moves to slow the infections in Brazil are being tripped up by the president's vehement opposition to a lockdown. Brian Quinn explains. In Sao Paulo, cemeteries forced to conduct nighttime burials to keep up with the flood of coffins as Brazil passes the grim milestone of more than 4,000 COVID-19 deaths in under 24 hours, nearly 4,200 on Tuesday. O Brasil é o epicentro da pandemia COVID-19 no mundo. Dia 1 de julho, o Brasil vai superar a marca de meio milhão de óbitos por COVID-19. Almost 340,000 Brazilians have now died of the virus, a death toll surpassed only by the United States, which has roughly one and a half times Brazil's population. Hospitals are overwhelmed. COVID patients now occupy more than 90% of intensive care beds in most Brazilian states. Critical treatments, including oxygen, are often in short supply, with patients in some cities dying as they wait for care. The situation has been aggravated by the emergence in Brazil of new, more contagious strains, such as the P1 variant that emerged in the Amazonas state last fall. A political tug of war over lockdowns hasn't helped. Far-right President Jair Bolsonaro has continuously opposed them, resulting in a patchwork of economic and social restrictions at the city and state level. As pessoas sentissem abalado no momento, mas a gente teria um, 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 um número de pessoas é, óbitos bem menor. Bolsonaro is now on his fourth health minister since the pandemic began. After initially casting doubt on vaccines, he's now promised to make 2021 the year of vaccinations. So far, though, less than 3% of Brazil's 210 million inhabitants have been fully vaccinated. Peru has also been hit with its highest single-day total of COVID deaths, close to 300. But as that country gears up for a presidential election this weekend, its economy seems to have taken the biggest hit from the pandemic. That has been devastating for a population where 70% of all jobs have no security or protection. People around Peru are going hungry, and more and more soup kitchens are popping up to make sure people just have enough to eat. Here's more from our team on the ground. Every day, a long line of people, entire families without any income, come here to get food to eat and make it through another day. Every day I come and get my lunch. With the pandemic, I can't work anymore. Plus, I'm elderly, so I can't find work anyway. I must stay at home at all time, and I need to find ways to survive. This soup kitchen is run by members of this poor community. An hour and a half from the capital, Lima, the cooks are volunteers. Every day, they give food to 48 local families. That's more than 100 people in total, chosen because they are the most vulnerable. As you can see, there's a long line of people. They leave their food containers in the morning and pick them up later. As for us, we're here. We cook every day from Monday to Saturday to give enough food to the people in need in our district. The organization Caritas provides food to more than 150 soup kitchens in all of Peru. This support is vital as these local initiatives allow several hundred thousand people to eat in Lima alone. The pandemic, just like a natural disaster, has unveiled the reality of our country. Many families lost those who had an income, like moms and dads. Children became orphans without any money. And many old people lost their children who used to provide for them. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has hit Peru hard. In 2020, the gross domestic product decreased by more than 12 percent, and more than 5 million people fell into poverty. We'll leave you now with a magical look at a forest in Mexico that's turned orange thanks to the migration of millions of monarch butterflies. The beautiful butterflies have seen a drastic decline over the past 20 years, with some 90 percent of them now gone. Arsenal Chantier has more on that sanctuary that's trying to save them. A slow-moving cloud of butterflies drenched in the colors of sunset. These are monarch butterflies, also known as Danaus plexippus, and they can be found in the forests of central Mexico perched at an altitude of 3,300 meters in the state of Michoacán. When they migrate to the area, patches of woodland turn from green to orange, drawing tourists from far and wide. A great sense of peace, internal peace. It's really beautiful. And they get up close and personal. The goal of the migration, which may take up to two days, is to find protection and hibernate during the winter months. And it's these trees that take on the role of their protectors. That said, getting here from Canada is no easy feat. It can take the monarch up to four generations to complete this journey. The first, second and third generations don't live longer than four or five weeks during the migration. The fourth or last generations that arrive here manage to live between eight to nine months. It's a mystery. We don't know how they manage to last so long. But that's not the only question. Given that Mexico has been losing trees at a higher rate than it did in 2019, conservationists are concerned for the monarch's survival. If we lose these trees, we won't have any more butterflies, so we guard them day and night to make sure they are not being cut illegally. And logging isn't the only threat. Climate change is the biggest factor responsible for falling trees and drought, and it takes a lot more than forest guards to reverse this global crisis. That's all the time we have for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next week for all the news from north to south.